is all about brokenness. See, and because of that, because of the price that they realize they're going to have to pay now to really be a disciple of Christ, many people at Stop 6 retreat. They don't want to go for it. They don't want to pay that price. And so they move back. Maybe they simply settle for church activity. Some of them we found actually move backwards even farther. They'll go back to stop three where they don't even go to church anymore. They don't worry so much about sin. They just live their life out. See, but those people who move on to stop seven realize I've been missing out on the depth of relationship I need to have with Christ. And it's not going to happen until I'm broken of sin, self, and society. Understanding that my sin still comes before having a deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus. Understanding that I haven't emptied myself of myself. I'm still the God of my life. And I let Jesus in. I let the Holy Spirit in. I let God the Father in when it's convenient for me or when it seems appropriately, appropriate situationally. They need to be broken of society because in our culture today, the culture influences us more than the ways of God do. The culture influences the church more than the church influences the culture. And so we need to be broken of these things. We need to empty ourselves of everything but the Holy Spirit guiding us to who God has called us to be. But it doesn't just happen. It's got to be a very intentional decision that you and I, as God's leaders, God's teachers, help people to understand this is the nature of the journey. This is the path that they need to pursue. It doesn't happen randomly. If a person gets to stop seven, hopefully they'll also then move to stop eight. After God has brought them through this stage of brokenness, stop eight on the journey is the healing that comes from surrender and submission. Realizing that the only reasonable thing for me to do now that I've been broken, now that that I ask God to take over, is to give him full control of my life, is to become completely dependent upon God in ways that very, very, very few American Christians ever do. We talk about this sometimes, but we rarely see it. As I did the research, I was shocked, dismayed at how few people actually reach this stage of surrender and submission. So we ask them to become people who give their lives over completely to God. Stop nine then flows from that. And stop nine is where people have a profound love relationship with God. Not just saying they love Him, not just throwing some money in the plate, not just coming and listening to the sermons and saying amen, but having a deep, deep relationship that's intense, it's intimate, it's ongoing, It fills their mind and heart every moment of every day. It changes the way that they look at the world. It changes the way they think about themselves. It alters the way that they understand their faith. It transforms the way that they recognize what Jesus did for them on the cross and what their responsibilities and privileges are in terms of reaching out to the world. And that brings them to stop 10 on the journey which is having an extreme love for other people. Now, I have to confess to you, when I did all this research, I looked at at the progression that was coming out of the research that we'd done, and I was finding that Stop 9 was having this kind of intimate, deep, incredible love relationship with God, and 10 being extreme love for people. I thought, well, I must have that flipped around. That can't be right. God is the ultimate, so the final stop on the journey should be loving the ultimate. But you know what I found is, no, 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 stop nine has to be that deep love with God. Because if we're called to love people and to love them in a way that, that's extreme, unlike anything we can do, we can't do that of our own accord. People aren't lovable. Only God can truly love them the way they need to be loved. And he can't really love them until we have that love relationship with him. Then we can love them because it's him loving them through us. We simply become the vehicle, the way through which he loves them. Do 
your people understand that journey? Do you understand that journey? You know, I mean, I didn't understand it until I spent six years trying to figure out what is the nature of this destination and the process. Now, I'll tell you some other observations and insights that came from the research. Most people in our churches have no idea what transformation is. They have no idea the stops on the journey. They have no idea what the ultimate destination of the journey is. You see, and if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to wind up there except by mistake. And I can tell you now, having done the research, very few people, uh, all right, honestly, I've never encountered one, who's been transformed by accident. It's a very intentional process. Second thing that I have to share with you, and I mean, this is one of those things that, that so often just breaks my heart as a researcher, looking at some of these numbers and realizing it's not numbers. These are millions of people. Each percentage point that I discover represents, you know, three million people in our country. And so when you look at a chart like the one that, that, that you're looking at now, what that shows you is most people never get beyond stop three on the journey. Remember, stop three is that they're just concerned about sin. They never do anything about it. When we talk about Christians, look at that chart and it shows you that most of them never get past stop five, which is where at stop four, they've asked Jesus to save them of their sin. Stop five, they get involved in a lot of religious activity. But if you've been listening to me describe the journey, you realize the heart of the journey is the second half, where you recognize, no, mere activity, religious activity, isn't the end game where you realize if I haven't been broken, if I haven't surrendered, if I don't have that love relationship with God and with people because of God, I've missed the best part of the journey. The hardest part, yes, but the best part. Do you realize that? As, I mean, look at those numbers. Only one out of every 20 Americans will ever reach stop seven on the journey. Most of them won't get beyond stop seven. But man, I tell you, you and I have been called to what we do to help people progress on this pathway. We have to change these numbers. Now, we can't do it. Obviously, it's the Holy Spirit that does it. But we can facilitate people being involved in this journey. Understand that on this pathway to wholeness, the stops don't always happen sequentially. And it's not always a progressive journey. What I mean by that is sometimes somebody will jump a stop or two. And other times a person will move backwards from a place where they've wound up. That's natural. It's not always good, but it's natural. So we can't be fooled by that. You know, a great example would be that a lot of times what happens is people will move from stop three, where they're concerned about sin, to stop five. They get involved in a lot of church activity, but they haven't accepted Christ yet. They haven't asked him to forgive them of their sins. So they might go from stop three to stop five to stop four, then back to stop five. Maybe they move on from there. That's okay. A lot of times people will move forward to a stop and then they'll drop backwards for a while. Part of what we need to do as leaders is to remain sensitive enough to what's going on in each person's journey to keep moving them forward, to not let them lose ground, to not let them feel comfortable retreating and taking the easy path, but to always be encouraging them and resourcing them to move forward in what they're doing on that journey. Here's something I want you to hear real loud and clear. I think this may be worth the price of admission for some of us today. And it's that we've got a real problem with the ordering the sequence of the stops on this journey. Have you thought about what I just described to you as being these 10 stops? Do you realize that biblically there's a real problem with this sequence? You see, the fact that stop seven occurs where it does is out of order, biblically speaking. It should come before stop four. Why? Because what's happening is people are quote-unquote, accepting Christ as their Savior without being broken of sin, self, and society. What is Jesus saving them from? 
if they're not being broken of these things. Here's, here's what I want you to hear and know my heart in this. I don't say this to be nasty or mean, rude, or to affront. I say this because I believe it's the truth based on the research I've been doing. What we have found is that in America today, in the church, we've become so adept at marketing salvation that people don't understand the nature of what they're really being asked to do. Think of it this way. We are a nation of consumers. We're always looking for a great deal. And what we've come to do in the American church is we go up to people and we say, have I got a deal for you. I can make sure that you never go to hell. I'm going to give you the free gift of salvation, the free gift that Jesus wants to give to you. All you have to do is say this little prayer and you've got eternity in the bag. Now, scripturally, of course, that's not the offer. You see, but because we're in a soundbite society where people are rushed, they're distracted, they're skeptical, we try to make this as user-friendly as possible. And so we tell them, you know what? You can take advantage of the free gift from Christ, the free gift of salvation. And what happens is, as consumers, we hear that and we think, hallelujah, I'm going to get the get out of hell free card and there's no strings attached. And so they say the magic prayer and they think, great, that's the end of it. And as you saw in the data I've showed you, for most people, that is pretty much the end point of their journey. How sad is that? Does that break God's heart or what? Because what we've done is we've abused that gift. See, we didn't explain to them that when the scriptures talk about the free gift of salvation, it doesn't mean that it's a gift that has no expectations, no consequences that come along with it. When the scriptures talk about the free gift, all they mean is this is something you can't afford. This is something you can't buy. This is a gift you can't earn. It can only be given to you. But if you truly understand and grasp the nature of this gift, it's got to change your heart. It's got to change your mind, your spirit. It's got to change everything about you. And so I want to ask you to take a hard look at what are you doing in your ministry related to this whole salvation process. Because what we're finding is that there's a lot of cheap grace in America today. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer would have talked about, the fact that people don't understand the depth of, of this salvation that they've taken on. People in America who say the magic prayer, just look at this as a great transaction where they exploited God. I tell you what, I don't want your people to be in that line of individuals who are simply trying to exploit God and get a great deal off him. Listen, the reality of salvation that Jesus offers of us is a great enough deal. Let's let them understand the totality of it and pursue it with all the passion that it must be pursued.